illustrator the author Lawrence Stern, who was born 300 years ago on the 24th of November 1713. Now at the National Portrait Gallery, it was painted in 1760 by Joshua Reynolds, London's most fashionable portrait painter, when Stern shot to fame thanks to his book The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. Its bawdy humour, quirky narrator and characters, an unusual take on what a novel should be had turned a country clergyman into a national celebrity. I first read Tristram Shandy many years ago and teach it to English students at Cambridge. No matter how many times I read Tristram Shandy, I discover something new and realise how significant Stern's influence on literature and culture has been. I'm especially interested in how, from the 18th century to the present day, readers have produced adaptations of Stern's work, and I recently published a book about it. In researching my book, I drew extensively on the Oates collection of Stern-related material held at Cambridge University Library. Stern was born in Ireland to a family of modest means, and he only managed to attend Jesus College in Cambridge thanks to an influential uncle. Like many people of his class, when Stern left Cambridge he became a clergyman in the Anglican Church. In 1760 he settled in the village of Coxwold in Yorkshire, where he wrote much of Tristram Shandy. He even jokingly called his cottage Shandy Hall. After all, Stern's readers had identified him with his fictional narrator, Tristram Shandy, a role he played up to. Why was Tristram Shandy such a sensation? Some people loved the book, some people loathed it, but everyone was talking about it. When Stern made the journey from Yorkshire to London, he was delighted to find that Tristram Shandy had sold so quickly that a copy couldn't be bought either for love or money. Tristram Shandy was different to the types of books readers were familiar with. Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Samuel Richardson's Pamela and Henry Fielding's Tom Jones are extremely popular novels that tell their stories in a straightforward way with clear plot lines and neatly described characters. Tristram tells his story in a haphazard way. He lives up to his name, as Shandy means crack-brained in Yorkshire dialect. Tristram isn't even born until the third volume of the book. He often starts an anecdote, then breaks it off, only to pick it up again several pages later. His opinions come thick and fast in a seemingly random order. Tristram's storytelling style also fulfills his claim that writing is but another form of conversation. He wants his readers to join in this conversation by following his narrative, not in quest of adventures, as they might find in Robinson Crusoe, but by getting to know Tristram and the Shandy family better by reading about their amusing habits, hang-ups and ideas. Tristram Shandy's packed full of characters who are just as eccentric as Tristram. His uncle Toby is a retired army officer obsessed with military plans and fortifications. He even recreates sieges and battles on his bowling green, as you can see in these illustrations of Tristram Shandy from the 18th and 19th centuries. Toby's a lovable character, all the more so because he's easily confused about quite simple things, because he brings everything back to his hobby horse of military fortifications. At moments when he's most perplexed, Toby whistles the tune of Lily Bolero, which you heard earlier. Lily Bolero is a throwback to Toby's old army days and to the battles fought in the wake of the Glorious Revolution. Parson Yorick is another memorable character from Tristram Shandy. Stern borrowed the name from Shakespeare, whom he greatly admired, but he also describes Yorick as being rather like Cervantes' Don Quixote, another literary hero. Although he's an important character throughout Tristram Shandy, Yorick's death is announced in Volume 1. Tristram reuses Shakespeare's famous quotation, Alas, poor Yorick, before printing two black pages that mark this sombre event. These black pages are one of Tristram Shandy's most distinctive visual features. Stern uses numerous similar devices throughout Tristram Shandy. The text is filled with asterisks and dashes of varying length. In some cases, these symbols can help to make a bawdy joke. Stern uses asterisks to cover a four-letter word, which Toby's apparently too modest to say. Stern sticks two marble pages partway through Volume 3 of Tristram Shandy. Marble sheets were usually used as the end papers, so by bringing them inside the book, Stern shows how unique Tristram Shandy is. He calls the marble pages the motley emblem of my work. Tristram also shows us just how zany his approach to storytelling is by drawing a diagram of his squiggly plot lines. Tristram Shandy's much more than just a collection of rude jokes, quirky characters and eye-catching visual devices. This squiggly line 
represents Trim swirling his stick in the air as he makes his argument for celibacy. Tristram suggests that his life is made up of opinions more than events. He wants to create a history of what passes in a man's own mind, where ideas, memories and bits of knowledge randomly spring into our heads. Tristram mentions John Locke's important essay concerning human understanding as a reference point for this idea. He often quotes from the many books he claims he's read, by Shakespeare, Cervantes, Rabelais and Montaigne. Tristram Shandy's filled with references to philosophy, classical literature, science, art theory, politics and medicine. Stern satirises contemporary medicine in the character of Dr Slop, the male midwife who's supposed to help deliver Tristram using his newfangled forceps. Stern held a dim view of these modern methods of childbirth, so makes Dr Slop a particularly unpleasant character. He's fat, bad-tempered and pompous, characteristics which many illustrators emphasised in their portraits of Slop. Tristram Shandy wasn't the only fictional book that Stern wrote. A sentimental journey through France and Italy is a travel narrative that mixes touching scenes with the more suggestive humour that had made Stern famous. Yorick's method of storytelling is also just as unpredictable and meandering as Tristram Shandy's, as this book illustration suggests. A sentimental journey became even more successful than Tristram Shandy and found fans right across Europe. Yet the popularity of both novels means that they have inspired imitations and adaptations in many different media. There have been poems, songs, plays, operas, and a huge range of visual images relating both to Stern and to his books, from Tristram Shandy's first book illustrations by William Hogarth onwards. The tradition of adapting Stern continues. The graphic satirist Martin Rosen produced a graphic novel version of Tristram Shandy in 1996. In 2005, the director Michael Winterbottom made A Cock and Bull Story, a film based on Stern's unfilmable book, starring Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Many famous writers have been influenced by Stern. Virginia Woolf and James Joyce adopt Tristram's haphazard method of telling stories as they pop into his mind in the stream-of-consciousness fiction they pioneered. Stern famously joked that he wrote not to be fed but to be famous. 300 years after his birth, his books continue to intrigue us. Thank you.